my fellow Idahoans, I'm pleased to join two of our leaders in Idaho education today to assure Idahoans that education is, in our, is our state's top priority. The past 13 months have presented enormous challenges for students, parents, teachers, and school administrators. The sudden changes in work life, home life, and social life, along with new ways of learning and instructing, have firmly placed the COVID-19 pandemic as one of the most difficult life experiences. A priority for me and Idaho is we don't want the pandemic to set us back in preparing students to succeed. We want to emerge from the experience stronger and more committed than ever to public education in Idaho. Idaho's public education system is locally driven. If parents or teachers spot something that concerns them, they should bring it to the attention of the teacher, principal, superintendent, or school board trustees and root out the problem at the local level, which is the closest and most responsive to our students and parents. Curriculum in Idaho is always the responsibility of your local school board. A skilled workforce demands investing in education at every level. We should be demonstrating to parents that their children's education is our priority. We should be signaling to parents that, or we should be signaling to teachers that we value them and we want to keep them in the profession. We should be laser focused on equipping teachers, parents, and schools with the tools they need to help students overcome learning challenges. We, we should be focusing our efforts on improving literacy, especially among the most challenged segments of our population, so they have a strong bedrock for future learning. We should be getting our kids college and career ready by pairing students with job prospects and teaching them the nuts and bolts skills they can use in jobs every day. We should be preparing our students to join our workforce and become lifelong learners. Idaho's on an incredible trajectory. We have the strongest economy in the nation. There is absolutely no reason not to continue that momentum by returning to our real priorities, students, families, teachers, and businesses. We should be working collectively toward the same thing, to prepare today's young people to be fulfilled and productive into the future. It is time to get back on track. That is what parents and employers expect and deserve. I want to thank Debbie Critchfield, our outgoing president of the State Board of Education, for her incredible leadership navigating public education during the pandemic. Thankfully, in Idaho, our schools were open longer than any other state and we were able to protect teachers, students, and families while continuing to educate our students. I want to welcome Kurt Liebeck, our incoming president of the State Board of Education. As a businessman, Kirk has been deeply involved in preparing our students with the skills and knowledge and character they need to be successful in a fast-changing economy. There's a lot of work of it ahead. Coming out of this pandemic, addressing the challenges associated with learning across elementary and secondary education and preparing our students to be college and career ready. I have confidence in Kurt's ability to drive the priorities and policies to keep our students, to allow our students to succeed and provide ongoing strong leadership over Idaho's K-12 and post-secondary system. Now Debbie and Kurt will speak about the board's work the past couple of days. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. I want to comment regarding the recent public discussions surrounding critical race theory. The legislature will be debating bills that would impact every learning environment from kindergarten to graduate education. Every student is entitled to a position neutral education. I want to repeat that. Every student is entitled to a position neutral education. This means that students are free to develop their own opinions and ideas without bias or prejudice from an instructor course, material, or even system. Today, the Board of Education discussed freedom for all speech and campus expression within our Idaho K-12 and post-secondary system. 
We discussed student course evaluations, how to develop social justice metrics for reporting, and how to acknowledge the student voice and experience on their campuses and in their classrooms. Ultimately, our system of public education is about Idaho students and their success. The Board of Education has heard the public discussion and directed our university presidents in this work. These are not small matters to us. Like all Idahoans, we want a system that encourages forums of intellectual discussion, where speech is not restricted and all viewpoints are respected. In a recent discussion with university students from Boise State University, Kurt Liebich and I, who is with me today, clearly heard that a balanced and unbiased education, rigorous in foundational and core academic coursework, should be the cornerstone of an Idaho public college or university. Every graduate who crosses the stage to receive a diploma from an Idaho public university should have the same experience. It is always unacceptable when a student of any age is made to feel intimidated or coerced into certain ways of thinking, whether it's specific ideologies or tenets which undermine the mission of free exchange of ideas. I want to affirm that parents and students have the right to see what is taught in our schools. I affirm support of our educators as licensed professionals who are held to high ethical standards. I affirm our support of trustees, the local leaders, directing the education of students that they receive in classrooms across Idaho. This support includes locally elected public school board members, charter school directors, and our two-year college trustees. These are our friends and neighbors, and they are volunteers. As the governing and oversight body for all Idaho education, we ask and continue to advocate that learning environments be uncensored and open, balanced and protected, so students are prepared for the world beyond the classroom and the university. The future prosperity of our state depends on their success and the success of Idaho public education system. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kurt Liebeck, and I newly elected president of the uh, State Board of Education. I want to thank governor for the governor for his vote of confidence. Uh, I want to thank President Critchfield and my fellow board members for uh, supporting me. Um, I guess I'd like to make a few comments about the board meeting that we had the last couple of days. But the first thing I'd like to do is thank Debbie Critchfield for her outstanding leadership. I, I made this comment during the board meeting, but. I don't think you could pick a more difficult time in the history of our state to be uh, the president of the State Board of Education um, and, and really for any educational leader in our state. Whether you're a school board chair, um, uh, whether you're a president of a university or whether you're Debbie uh, or any board member, the balance between trying to preserve the health and safety of our students and teachers and at the same, and, and while knowing that uh, having kids in the classroom is the best way to learn. I mean, striking that balance uh, was incredibly difficult. And I think Debbie and the governor and all the educational leaders in our state have just done a masterful job at uh, striking that balance. And as a result, more of our kids were in school um, than in many of our in states across the country. More of our kids were able to participate in extracurricular activities. And that's because of the leadership of the governor and Debbie and, and all the leaders in the state. Um, I want to speak a little bit about our board meeting the last couple days. Um, you know, if you had asked me what the legislature would have focused on uh, as the session began, I would have thought the conversation would have been about the impact of the pandemic and how that uh, the pandemic has Im impacted student learning, uh, how it's magnified the achievement gaps, and what we collectively as a state need to do to address that. But that's not where the conversation has been at, at all. It's been about the issue of do we or do we not indoctrinate kids do we or do we not have freedom of expression? And, uh, you know, to us, I think, I speak for myself as a member of the state board, it's when, you know, as a state board member, when you have a constitutional duty to supervise uh, our educational institution, it's deeply concerning when you hear uh, dialogue that suggests we are in any way indoctrinating kids. Um, I have enormous confidence in our local school boards, and my belief is that if anything like that was occurring, that the policies and procedures that we have at the local level would address it and address it quickly. Um, but we hear what the we hear the concerns of the legislature. There are concerns that there are students on our campuses that don't feel like they can speak, or when they speak, they feel like they um, could get threatened or, or don't, don't feel comfortable. And so I think there is work for the state board to do, and we talked about that work here today. 
I think the first thing we can do is to brush up on our the policies that we have in place. Um, you, you, if you go to the board policy, or if you go to the board packet for this meeting, you'll see that there, I think some things we can learn from other states. Um, there's a, there's the University of Chicago came up with a statement called the Chicago Principles. And I think if we take our board policy around freedom of expression and academic freedom, and we incorporate some of those Chicago Principles, I think we can come out up with a much more visible policy around uh, freedom of speech and, and freedom of expression. And then I think we need to turn our attention to actually collecting objective data. Too much of the conversation in the legislature is based on uh, anecdotal uh, evidence. Um, there isn't a lot of fact or data around this debate. And so I think as a state board, we need to take a leadership role in that area. And I think we need to ask our universities um, to collect data about the climate, to, to, to collect data from their students around do they feel like they are in a place that can, uh, where they can speak freely. And so the state board's committed to doing that work. We're going to take a leadership role in this area. We're, we're going to work with our presidents on our campuses uh, to move this work forward. Um, I understand this, the debate nationally. Um, there are a lot of things that are happening on higher ed campuses across the country that cause me concern. I think there are campuses where students uh, don't feel like they can uh, say what they believe on certain issues. I don't think we have those issues in Idaho. I think we have the policies and procedures in place, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't get to stay out in front of it and uh, put the disciplines in place and structures in place to ensure that our campuses are always places where students and our faculty can speak freely. In terms of our priorities uh, as a state board, I can't speak for the whole board, but I'll, I'll just make a few comments there and then I'll turn, open it up for questions. You know, when the governor came into office, he, he really focused on uh, literacy and college career readiness, and we haven't lost sight of those priorities. I think you'll see us, um, as we get through this pandemic, redoubling our efforts uh, around improving K-3 literacy, uh, improving college and career readiness. Um, so those, those will remain important to us. But I do think the pandemic is, is, uh, and the impacts of that are going to be high on our board's priority list as well. Um, there's no question that the pandemic has had an impact on student achievement, and it's had an impact on the social and emotional well-being of our kids. And I think as a board and, and the entire system is going to have to be focused to address those issues. Um, so with that, I will uh, conclude my remarks, and I think Debbie and I would both be willing to uh, any questions that the media might have. So thank you. Um, I have a question. This is Betsy Russell uh, with the Idaho Press, and I came in a, a couple of moments late. I apologize if I missed it. Is the state board taking any position on House Bill 377, which just passed the House on a party line vote? Um, I'll, I'll take that question as um, I've been in the role to uh, participate in those conversations. No, we were not in a position uh, to have a position. The board had not met and was meeting when it was debated on the floor. And um, I was, and I want to acknowledge that I did have a seat at the table during those discussions, and um, I appreciate that, and, and that matters to me, and that matters to the Board of Education uh, to have a voice, and uh, there weren't agreements across the board, but it was a great discussion, and it was a, an opportunity, a needed opportunity for me to, uh, to share the concerns and thoughts of, of how we work to these same outcomes. Frankly, we don't disagree on, on what it's trying to accomplish. We wanted to ensure that there weren't um, unintended consequences or um, unnecessary ripple effects that would damage what, what we all to be believe to be important, that's protecting the speech. Hi, this is Melissa Davlin with Idaho Public Television. I have a question on something that board member Liebich said. You mentioned um, the need for data collection as opposed to anecdotes and stories passed around. Is there a solid plan for looking into this in a strategic and comprehensive way or is that still in the discussion phase? It's, it's still in the works. Um, you know, I think it's really important for a lot of these issues not to be driven from a top-down state board perspective. And so what we talked about as a state board, that we really need to engage uh, our institutional leadership, uh, our faculty senates, um, 
across the state of Idaho in this work. Uh, I don't think we need to recreate the wheel. There's some, uh, uh, there's some models out there that I think we can replicate. So to me, South Dakota is an interesting model. Um, South Dakota has adopted the Chicago principles that I spoke about, and they've uh, incorporated into some of the, their requirements um, objective reports, like the one I commented on earlier that we, we could you know, require. And, and I think it should be state board driven, um, but we're going to need the support and uh, uh, guidance of our institutions. Uh, thank you so much. As a quick follow up, is there any discussion about um, interfacing or working with the Lieutenant Governor's task force looking at some of these issues? Well, I think the state board's going to have to be uh, connected to that to that work. Um, I, I get really concerned when the word indoctrination gets thrown around. I just I just have seen no evidence of, the, of that, and so when you throw that around loosely in a way that undermines the confidence of the educational system, I'm, that causes me great concern. But look, I think the state board, and I don't know the details yet because it's still, it, I, think, I think they're still developing the task force, but I would expect there, there would be state board staff that would be connected to that work. And clearly, if, if there's any evidence that comes out that there actually is that type of indoctrination happening in our K-12 system, the state state board is going to act. Um, I just have a hard time believing, um, based on my confidence in the local school boards, that, that we're going to find that. But let, let the work proceed, and, and we're going to stay engaged. And if action is required, uh, our board is prepared to uh, lead in that way. Kevin Richards has a two-part question. So I had a qu quick kind of two-part question for the both of you. Um, Mr. Liebich, you talked about how you thought this session was focused more on learning loss and the achievement gaps. And the session obviously got away from that. We're 102 days into the session, though. Do you feel like uh, the board should have stepped in sooner to address some of these issues and try to move the debate back to achievement issues? I'll start with the question and um, let, let Kurt uh, tack on as it was his original statement. I don't believe that we came too late to the party on this. We've had a consistent theme, uh, frankly, for the last two years when the governor's education task force came into being two summers ago nearly. These are topics that we've continued to, to press and to stress, and specifically on um, ideology, indoctrination, protection of speech, those types of things. Uh, we have been deeply involved um, in these conversations since they began. It was somewhat of a mo moving target um, over the last little while on how, that, how the legislature believed that could be accomplished, some of their um, desires and some of their thoughts. And, and so as things have come together more quickly, it was a, a, a slow process up until the last couple of days. Um, we've, we've been with it every step of the way. Yeah, and I, I would agree with that. And look, for education to function really well in this state, there needs to be alignment. And and because I think Senator Crabtree, you know, he commented to me once that the legislature really is the bank. And uh, you you know, in any business, you need to have the support of your bank to do what needs to be done. And so I think the more alignment we can have around what our joint objectives are between the state board and legisl legislative leadership and uh, chamber leadership and in the, in the uh, respective ed committees the more alignment we can have around that i think the more quickly we'll be able to push education forward in this state and you know to me it's it's uh i just think we've missed an opportunity here to not have the debate centered on what i spoke about earlier is the impacts of the pandemic but look uh, I, i'm not going to discount the concerns that the legislature has and uh um, I wish there was more facts around those concerns because I think it would be easy, easier to have a, a measured debate. But we're going to be paying close attention as a state board. And again, if we, if we need to uh, step in in any way uh, to deal with some of the concerns of the legislature, we'll do that. And if I can quickly follow up, um, you talked about taking a position on House Bill 377, and I know that bill has moved pretty quickly. But the state board didn't take a position on House Bill 352, which has sort of some origins uh, in House Bill 377. It didn't take a position on 364, which has already passed the House and is on its way, it's in the Senate. 
Did the state board consciously decide not to weigh in on legislation this year, especially these kind of pieces of legislation? Yes, is the short answer. Uh, we were consistent in that we didn't weigh in on, on many of these things. And uh, the reason for that, we felt that it was appropriate for the legislature to have those debates. We were at the table, we were invited. We have, um, I, I guess, across the board, uh, pillars, if you want to call them, on how we approach education. And so um, as we were approached and solicited for what do you think about this or that, then we would go to, well, the board has said this previously. Here are initiatives. And if, if those work to support those overall goals, then we were in alignment with those things. But we did not come out with any formal positions, again, wanting that debate to take place uh, with the lawmakers. Uh, Joe Paris with KTVB here. Um, I'm curious, has the State Board of Education had any substantiated claims of social justice indoctrination or critical race theory indoctrination in any classrooms across Idaho? I know in the legislature we've heard um, anecdotal cases and anecdotal concerns, um, but as we continue to investigate, there doesn't seem to be any, I guess, hard evidence or data about substantiated claims. And I'm curious if the State Board has seen any themselves. I'll, I can just I'll speak for myself and not the state board. Um, since this debate has has um, uh, begun in the legislature, uh, folks have forwarded me um, examples of of what you describe, um, and I've tried where possible to to try to put those in context because. The problem is if you just take a, a snapshot of a lecture or you just take a snapshot of assignment, you don't see the context of the entire instruction that's going on. And so um, I, uh, I haven't seen any evidence of systematic uh, issues you know, across the system. But look, you know, in our K-12 system, we have 300,000 kids. We have 14, 15,000 students. There are going to be times where a teacher may advocate more or maybe teach a lesson that parents and students aren't comfortable with. That's going to happen in a system as large as, as ours. And there are going to be times on our higher ed institutions where students feel uncomfortable because they feel like one side has been presented uh, in a way that made them uncomfortable or where they couldn't speak their voice. But I think the point is that um, in each of those cases, we have policies and procedures to deal with the issue. Uh, at the, you know, it's, we have that at, at the local school district level. We have those at our institutions. So uh, that's a long-winded uh, answer to your question, but I have not personally seen any evidence of, of systematic indoctrination or, uh, you know, stifling of free speech um, in a systematic way. But again, you know, there, there, you know, there are incidents. There are always going to be incidents, and we just have to be proactive in how we deal with them. If I could just uh, and a quick follow. Oh, excuse me. If you had, oh, I, I just wanted to tack on to that by saying, um, like Kurt, we'd heard a lot of stories, and um, you need to talk to so and so, or can somebody give you a call? I had heard about a cer certain student activity, um, and Kurt was with me yesterday, as as well as um, Board Vice President Andy Scoggin, where we were able to hear directly from a student who had first-hand experience something that we had been hearing about. Yesterday was the first time I had had first-hand knowledge of something, and, and we committed, the three of us, uh, to understand how that's happening, why, what we need to do, what conversations we need to have with our presidents so that our students don't feel that type of pressure on their campuses. And if we're doing ed education well, there should be that tension. There should be people feeling uncomfortable in any given debate. And so when people feel uncomfortable, I would expect that it's going to rise through the process we have to resolve these issues. But, uh, you know, that's the key. I think, that, you know, to our principles, we believe in freedom of speech and academic freedom. That's what we hold dear. And uh, my concern with some of the legislation that, that's either pending or proposed is it, it treads dangerously close to uh, um, crossing that line from my perspective. So. And a follow-up to that, um, we've spoken with educators and students who tell us that, quite frankly, they weren't even sure what critical race theory was, and they're very sure it wasn't in their classroom, and they're concerned that this entire conversation is a distraction and maybe a veiled attack on Idaho public education as a whole. 
Are there concerns that this is an attack on Idaho education and that this critical race theory claim is something that's just being used? I'll tell you that the, the day after um, this really hit the news cycle um, after the House floor debate, I attended the Region 3 uh, superintendents meeting um, here in the Boise area. And out of curiosity, uh, I asked by a raise of hands how many of them uh, were familiar with the term uh, before they had to Google it last, the night before. And um, no hands went up. And so I don't know if it's a distraction. I don't know. To Kurt's point, we don't know where this is and, and what it is. And so as our board discussion today leads us to a place to say, let's do more than talk about stories and, and wonder about these things. Um, let's get to work on Ooh. developing metrics. Let's have some data. Let's have some understanding of what it is that we're dealing with. And then when we know what the context is, we're better prepared to find some solutions and resolutions for folks. The only thing I would add is I, I think, and I mentioned it earlier, I think when you loosely throw around the term indoctrination as a system-wide problem, that's an attack on our system. And uh, I would hope, before we use language that loosely, that we had substantive evidence that that, that in fact was occurring. Because what it does is it undermine, you know, most parents in our state don't have time to dig into the issues to the extent that uh, Debbie and I do or, or other board members, and so they depend on the media. Uh, for, as a source of information. And so when they hear those words, uh, I, if I was a parent, I'd be concerned. So I just think before, as a state, we loosely throw those terms around, we, we should have pretty concrete evidence that indeed that's, that's what's hap happening. And I, don't, and I don't believe it is. Thanks so much. Uh, this is Betsy Russell with the Idaho Press. Again, I have a, a quick follow-up and an additional question. So. Debbie, you said that the cons your concern was to make sure that there weren't un unintended consequences to the legislation that was proposed. The House has now passed legislation. Do you feel that there are unintended consequences that will impact education in Idaho to that legislation, House Bill 377? I don't know how to answer that question, frankly. Um, I think that when it is uh, in law and um, as educators across the state, whether you're a first grade teacher or a postgraduate uh, medical instructor uh, will have a better understanding of what those implications are. That was the, the hope and the goal, as, as I've talked to those put it together, that it's not about limiting speech but protecting all speech. And indeed, that's where we want to be. Um, it's, it's hard to know right this very minute when it's only a minute's minutes beyond uh, going through the house we'll see what the senate has to say and then we'll we'll be able to understand as it as it gets to work uh, what what that means and then there was yeah. a new argument i'm sorry there was a new argument brought up in the house debate today saying that um, although up until this point all we'd heard this session was all these complaints from the idaho freedom foundation and so forth that now the concern is some new federal rules that are going to come down that are somehow going to constitute a federal takeover of curriculum in the Idaho schools. Are you all aware of this? Have you heard anything about this? What do you think of those comments from legislators? Well, this is uh, fresh information uh, like you, uh, things that I've heard in the last couple of days, some of it coming directly read from um, some federal guidance, others were an analysis of the federal guidance. And so I think understanding where we are and, and what we're looking at is, is really critical to this. I would emphasize the fact that we have locally elected boards and that's the system that we have in Idaho. And I know what the federal um, intrusions are into the state from the state board perspective. And um, I'll tell you that local control is alive and well. And so if you have concerns, go talk to your, your local board member, the two-year college trustee, the charter school administrator, and sit down with them and, and say, how do you see this impacting what you're able to do? Um, I believe it's going to be a, a minimal impact, uh, but as we understand more, then, then we strengthen the process that we have for local uh, leaders. One more question. Uh, hi, this is uh, Troy Oppie at Boise State Public Radio. Uh, you mentioned that there are policies in place uh, to deal with complaints as they as they come up. Did lawmakers ask what those policies were, and and when it was explained what those policies were, did they share concerns that those policies already in place don't go far enough, and and that's why they want to take some of these steps? 
I'll take this one again. Um, as I've been uh, heavily involved in these conversations, yes, our the board policies. There's a student responsibility, and we're, if we're talking about higher ed, um, we've got a student responsibility and a faculty responsibility for all of these things. I think one of the um, issues was that one that it's not well known, um, and two, what kind of teeth are involved. That was some of the um, feedback that I received when we said that the board wants to go through a process of evaluating if those make sense. They're twenty year on the book old policies which isn't to say that they're uh, not valid but I think they're it, it's worthy of, of a new discussion and so I think part of that issue um, was addressed or was trying to be addressed through the legislation in, in the k-12 arena we know that that all educators entering the the profession as licensed professionals have a code of ethics and so uh, strengthening what we've already got and making sure that that people understand that we're not a system without rules expectations standards etc um, is really vital right now Thanks. yeah i would just i'd just like to thank everyone for participating today you all are a really important part of of this system because it, it's through you that uh the information gets to many parents so we thank you for your interest in this and uh, we look forward to working with you as we try to advance education in the future so thank you